What's good with the YouTube with Convict's Perspective? It's your boy, Big Flacco, coming in with my co-host, Big Senor the Rojo. Coming in, as always, with a little bit of energy, man. And today, we're going to be talking about a very uh, influential member, a past member, you know, who's, who's uh, died in 1972, as you guys all know the story, man. But we're going to talk a little bit about Rudolfo Cheyenne Cadena, as well as we're going to elaborate a little bit of facts that we know about this individual as well, man. Uh, he was very instrumental in... Uh, changing the direction of El Mexicano Encarcelado, also known as the Mexican Mafia. So I'm going to let Rojo uh, read a little article about him, and then we're going to expand and, and give our perspective a little bit about this individual. All right, man. This is this is a, a short biography I found on a place called People Pill, and uh, we'll get right to it. Shai Cadena was a wayward youth and a member of Barrio Viejo Gang in Bakersfield, California. He was incarcerated at Duell Vocational Institution after he and a childhood friend from the same street gang, Richard Ruiz, who would become one of the founding members of La M.A., stabbed a Bakersfield man to death outside of the Salon Juarez dance hall in 1959. At the time of his conviction, Rudy was only 16 years old. While incarcerated, he earned the respect and admiration of the members of the Mexican Mafia, also known as La M.A., which was still in its developmental stage. And then there's like a little side thing in here, man. Now, now you guys trip on this. This doesn't sound realistic to me, but I'm gonna read it as it is written. By 1961, administrators at DVI, alarmed by the escalating violence, had transferred a number of the Charter MA members to San Quentin, hoping to discourage their violent behavior by intermingling them with hardened adult convicts. It didn't work. For example, the story goes that Cheyenne Cadena arrived on the lower yard and was met by a six foot five, 300 pound black inmate who planted a kiss on his face, on his face and announced the scrawny teenager would now be his bitch. Shai returned a short time later, walked up to the unsuspecting perpetrator and stabbed him to death with a jailhouse knife. There are more than a thousand inmates on the yard. No witnesses stepped forward and only one dead man entertained the idea that Cadena was anybody's bitch. Now that sounds kind of far-fetched, man, but who that's knows? The third time, that's, a, that's the third time I've heard that story, though. We're going to we're gonna have to ask one of the OGs down there, bro. We are, most definitely. All right. This is going back to the article now. That was a little side excerpt. Cadena and Joe Pegleg Morgan, who became his best friend and mentor, led the gang to prominence in the California correctional system by terrorizing other unorganized ethnic inmate groups, gaining a monopoly over the sale of drugs, pornography, prostitution, extortion, as well as murder for hire. Cadena continued to run the mafia's activities and began to look beyond the walls of prison, envisioning a, envisioning a statewide monopoly of crime. He struck an uneasy alliance with George Jackson and the Black Gorilla family and became active in Latino political organizations like the Brown Berets. Cadena made overtures to unite La M with the rival Nuestra Familia, but his peace talk with the quote unquote Farmeros were frowned upon by Joe Morgan and other senior MA leaders. In response, they ordered the murder of two Nuestra Familia leaders just prior to an important peace conference between Cadena and death row Joe Gonzalez, NF leader at Chino Reception, undermining Cadena's peace mission and effectively green lighting it. With no remaining influence in the Mexican mafia, his importance in the eyes of the NF was dis diminished. He was now a target for retribution. Cadena could have saved, uh, excuse me, man, we, uh, where did this go? Man, damn, I gotta pause this, bro, son of a Sorry about that, YouTube. The page just changed for no reason whatsoever. Cadena could have saved himself by requesting protective custody, a move that would have shown weakness to the way of life he had fought and killed for. His fate effectively sealed. He chose instead to go out the way he had come in, fighting. On his arrival in Chino for the now sabotaged peace mission, he was taunted by the Norteños and told his time would come. The night before his death, Cadena had received multiple death threats and knew that when he left his cell in the morning, he would be leaving it permanently. On the morning of December 17, 1972, Cadena was asked if he wanted to leave his cell with the rest of the prisoners 
rather than avoiding his fate and staying in his cell. He stepped in the tear of his cell in Palm Hall at the Chino Reception Center. He was stabbed repeatedly. Man, I don't know why this keeps moving around. Bear with me, guys. He was stabbed repeatedly with shanks and beat with a pipe by familiar assassins. He was stabbed the estimated 50 times on the tier, thrown off a third story tier onto the concrete floor below and stabbed another 20 times. Cadena was subsequently buried at Union Cemetery in Bakersfield, California with an inscription reading, remembered by your mother and family. Cadena's murder sparked an era of gang warfare within the California penal system. Over the next year, the lives of 31 prisoners were lost in tit-for-tat killings. The carnage and animosity from his murder still exists more than 36 years after his death, as La Emme still has a kill on site order for any member of the Nuestra Familia. Bear in mind this article's a little older. Cadena was the basis for the 1992 movie American Me, in which Montoya Santana, a character based upon Cadena, was portrayed by Edward James Almost. The Mexican Mafia, however, was enraged, enraged by certain parts of the movie, especially the portrayal of Santana being raped and the climax in which Santana is murdered by his own followers. Two of almost his own consultants were subsequently killed and the plot to extort the director was uncovered. I mean, that's that's the article in a nutshell. My apologies, um, something was weird about this website. It just kept jumping to other pages, but uh, I find that very interesting. I hadn't heard that thing that you claim to have heard about the, the large black male approaching him in Quentin. That's a trip. See, what people don't realize, realize right, about uh, Cheyenne is I believe he was only about, let me see, uh, 29 or 30 years old at the time of his death. He wasn't that old. Um, like everybody says, we already know that Widow Buff uh, Flores is one of the ones that kind of started the MA trying to create a super gang, and that was their whole focus point when they started the El Mexicano Carcelado, also changed the name over to Mexican Mafia. Um, but Cheyenne was one of the ones that built it into a criminal en enterprise, as well as with Joe Peg Lake Morgan, and that's noted in history. I think that he had a change of heart later on. Um, as far as he started to, to dive into radical beliefs, revolutionary purposes, as far as for the prisoners, his, his association with George Jackson, which was a loose-knit, alliance but it was to seek out common goals and this is where the change where his whole philosophy changed from there and what a lot of other people don't realize is one of the founders of the nf right chalo hernandez they were blood cousins chalo also had radical beliefs revolutionary beliefs for latinos so they were basically had the same page and this is this is where everything gets a little little sketchy right because i think it was 1971 Cheyenne was on his way to actually take out his own cousin, believe it or not, and got popped on a parole violation. I don't know if this is the same violation that led him to Chino Palm Hall where he met his death, but um, I do know for a fact that at one time in his life, he was actually going to take out his cousin for being an NF member. Um, you know, uh, with Cheyenne, there's, there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about, man. Uh, you know, you talk to every older NF member. You know, I mean, I've talked to, to Hobo. I've talked to... Uh, you know, Dave, Dave Batista, he watches the channel. Shouts out to Dave Batista. Um, I talked talk to Sundown. Every NF member has said the same thing. They did not have to kill him. You know what I mean? But this was basically a killing that was to set an example for all the killings that were, were taking place because a lot of familianos were getting killed at that time. In Susanville to Hatchby, as well as a few got stabbed in Chino. I think uh, the uh, Woozy Reyes got stabbed in Chino. I think Diamond got killed up there in Susanville. And a couple other people got killed around the same time while they were trying to form a peace. Because they've been at war for approximately, I think, five years. They call it the five-year war, but it was actually only four years, from 68 to 72. And at that time, they were trying to force some type of peace peace uh, agreement at that time. But a lot of the, a lot of the old metals were not respecting it. They looked down upon the NF, like they're a bunch of lame farmers and all that stuff. We heard the stories over and over again, man. Um, but Cheyenne's death... You know, within the NF history, the significant impact it has was this is why we were never supposed to ever have a peace treaty, because the MA had vouched revenge and blood over this killing, right? Because this was the first part of MA brass. I know MA doesn't have no top edge line uh, uh, leadership, but if ever if there was ever to be anybody that was looked at as leaders, it would have been Cheyenne and, and Peg Lake Morgan. So because because of the death of Cheyenne. 
The MA has always vouched revenge and blood. Therefore, the NF has always stated, I've read this in our history, that we will never engage in any type of peace talks with, with the Mexican mafia. Yeah, man, it seems uh it seems that finally it finally dissipated a little bit, <laughs> at least as far as uh the recent events within the hostilities and all that kind of stuff, you know. Seems like maybe Cheyenne was just uh, born in the wrong era, you know. You know, this seems like it was his vision as well as some uh, some of the, the, the visions, you know, of the, the older NF members, you know, to end that war. It it just wasn't that the political climate back then was just different, you know. Today's setting nowadays, yeah, I could see it flying, but there was a different kind of person back then, man, that wasn't so quick to forgive and forget, maybe, I guess. That lack you know, of another way to put it. You know, they call the people that, that removed him the Fabulous Five. You've heard that before, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Joker, Joker from uh I want I keep I always Joker from Redonda, uh Masanas from New York, Crackers Vindiola from uh 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 from Fresno. Tiny Contreras, who's the one that was the, down there in the first tier, who stabbed him 20 times, man, actually took his watch in the process, you know what I mean? Um, what I found interesting about this article, right, is that they say that a year after this death, there was 31 murders that were that were happened that were tick for tack. Yeah, I, I think I told you, man, I seen a, a drawing back in the days that either Tibbs or Corny had. I want to say Tibbs had it. There was a, it was a big old collage with all kinds of like uh, burial plots with names on them. You know what I mean? On one side, it was like, you know, them guys from down the way. And on the other side, it was the guys from up north, you know, essentially, you know. And uh, there was a lot of graves, bro. There was a lot of them. Yeah. It sounds like about the right number, 30 something. I would imagine that's real, real close to to the number, man. Well, that's when that that's when that led to the validation clampdown act in 1976 to where they all separated them and put them on their own yards. Yeah. Or their own tiers. They could be on the same facility, the same prison, like in San Quentin, there was an NMA there, but they'd have them on different tiers, they'd have them on different exercise yards. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, anything post 76, it was really hard to, for anybody that was NF or MA to really interact with each other because they had them all separated. But then again, you would ha you would have uh, as far as within the NF, you had sleepers out there that were undercover. I mean, I would think that most that there would be a few MA members that wouldn't get found out that would sit there if they asked them, oh, you know what I mean? I'm not MA. Because neither right. neither one of these organizations, they had they had a code of omerta where they weren't supposed to talk to police or admit their existence. So the numbers get kind of a little bit, you know, uh questionable about how many deaths, you know, we can go about that all the time. Whether you were a sympathizer or a member, you were part of that group one way or another. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I could list at least one or two members myself of the other side that I know that were killed by main members. You know what I'm saying? Bobby Zapata from, uh, from uh, Big Bassett. He was killed by uh, Daniel Loza, who I want to call Pollo from, from Chino in 1972. And the thing that's interesting I've seen about that, right, is this right here is that you have people from the MA, ex MA members that say, oh, yeah, that. Bobby Zapata was a Mexican Mafia member, but when they, they but they, what they try to do is they try to sit there and say that Daniel Loza, Boyle, wasn't NF yet. How would they know? Exactly, because I talked to two NF members from that time period that both say that he was an NF member at the time of that hit. So yeah, it, like, it don't okay. matter. I mean, there was a bunch on both sides. I mean, that's all there is to it. I totally agree, man. We can yeah, you can, you can try, to, try to say whatever, man, but uh, everyone knows better. You know, but th that killing, it, it caused a, a splurge of violence to where they ended up being separated, man. And, you know, it's, I think after, I think the last time any type of killing happened, I think it was Sharky who was killed in DVI in 1975. I think that was the last time an NF member was killed by a Mexican Mafia member. So from 75, man, to maybe 2021, I mean, I don't think that there's been any, any murders on either side. I don't but think during, so either. But during that time period, man, there was a lot. You know what I'm saying? There was a lot that were going tick for tack, man. And, you know, Cheyenne, like I said, man, you know, uh, he was the head of his time era. You know what I'm saying? And he was trying to push for change. And I think he came into this with a criminal mindset. 
but I think he had had a conscience of what he was seeing, what was going on towards La Raza and all that, man, because, you know, he was a part of it. He was part of the oppression. He was a part of suppressing others, you know. He was for all the abuse that they were doing to his, to his gente. And for some for some reason, you know, maybe it was a, a sense of maturity. Maybe it was his relationship with his own blood cousin. I don't know. He wanted to create that change. It was never fortunate to see his vision take place. And I don't think a lot of people on both sides wanted to see it happen, to be honest with you, man. Because there was a lot of egos at stake at that time. A lot of murder. You yeah. know, Joker, Joker at one time, he wanted to be re recruited to, into the MA. And they declined him. You know what I mean? Another individual, Black Bob, they wanted they wanted to recruit Black Bob into the NBA. He was subbed up with uh, Champ Reynoso. He declined. He ended up becoming an NF member. So there's a lot of, you know, people don't say that there was not a little bit of ego within these organizations, you know, a little power struggle. Man, it totally existed at that time, man. So if you got a chance to take, take out an opposition, it was going to happen. You know, it's a trip, too, is back then, like, uh, I could see why it, there wasn't a big backing to make no beast. It's because there wasn't really, you know, the consequences yet, you know, with as far as the Ricos and the indeterminate shoes and all that and this and that. So it's like, why do you want to make peace with them dudes to hell with them dudes on either side? You know what I mean? Fast forward a little bit, you get these Ricos, you get these indeterminate shoes. And now there's like other factors that play into more like, yeah, well, we don't got to kill them guys. We don't got to be best friends with them. We do our thing. They do theirs, which is similar to what's happening now. You know what I mean? There's more of an incentive to do it now. You know what I'm saying? Let's keep it real, though, too. These men at this time, they were hardcore convicts. They're gangsters. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They were gangsters. You didn't have a, a, a what I would call a diluted system. You right. know what I'm saying? When they changed the laws and they started sending people in for uh, residential burglaries, Check fraud. Cases, DUI. Check fraud, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It kind of changed the system. It changed, you know, they started creating the level one, two, three, four. And so therefore you didn't really have people who were like hardcore criminals or convicts that, you know, that gained membership into these organizations, you know? And those that were considered hardcore members, they ended up getting slammed, slammed down. Right. So what did you do? You had slim pickings on these yards. So this is the creation that, that occurred with the Sudanios and North Daniels, man. They started to, you know, impose their will on these yards. And that's where all the, all the things changed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I get you, man. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I would, I would say that the the climate back then, man, there was, there was no, there was no reason to, to ever be at peace, you know? And nowadays, man, think the times have changed, man. I mean, I know it sounds like a, I'm saying it over and over and over, but the fact of the matter is, like you said, back then people were gangsters. They were going to continue to be about that action. There was no, increased penalties for for going about their business you know nowadays after the shoes getting out of that you know warfare style that it was in the 70s keeps them out on the main lines there ain't no money in the shoes there ain't no none of this there ain't no none of that so i mean the system has actually played a part in a sense a broker in the peace you know it seems like a lot of times they promote violence and this and that but uh, by 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 reaching that agreement during the end of hostilities to let them out, as long as that there's no multi-group violence, they played a part too, man. It's a trip, bro. It's a trip. It's you it's know, just a different time. It's just a different day and age, bro. You know, Cheyenne was also instrumental in other areas as far as within the MA. He was able to infiltrate, you know, politicians at that time. He was able to infiltrate like a uh, uh, drug uh, drug rehab centers. They had their hands in a whole lot of mist of things just by their presence as far as they were able to infiltrate, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's the one thing that you have to understand about the MA, man. They've always been able to, to, to establish some type of taxation out there in the communities. Not just drug dealers. They were able to hit politicians at that time, even law enforcement, as well as, you know, uh, nonprofit organizations. They were doing things right. You know what I mean? As far as if you want to, as far, well, excuse me, not right, but as far as with a criminal organization, agenda they just didn't tax out that i mean those little uh, uh elote mans and mercados and markets all those people are getting taxed to this day you know i mean they sent the president out there for this to occur you know what i'm saying yeah. so when you when you think about the mexican mafia and their activities today the things that they do yeah they tax dope dealers they have connections with the cartels they have all that stuff that's that's well established you know what i mean but they were able to infiltrate these communities back then and form that taxation 
on just private businesses, private sectors. Right. You know what I'm saying? They've always been able to take advantage of their own people. Let's call it what it is. You know what I'm saying? If you, if you have a man coming out there, a lote man, or, or one of these taquerias at the Mercados, and you're getting and they're paying taxes, what are you doing? You're oppressing your own people. But that's always been the agenda of the MA, is to always profitize money. You know what I'm saying? Which they kind of find it, I look in contrast, you know, like the NF was really never able to do that. Maybe in the 70s, they would go out for like maybe some brothels or, you know what I mean, some uh, uh, some local bars in their community. But um, they never they never would go out there like to, like the, you know, the flea markets and, and tax the vendors. And yeah, stuff they like wouldn't that. mess with civilians. They'd only go after people that were involved in the lifestyle in some form or fashion. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Whereas as them, man, they took the criminal enterprise to a whole nother level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And Cheyenne, Cheyenne's one of the ones that was responsible for that, man. You know, I don't know, like I said, I don't know if he had a change of heart. Um, and maybe him dabbling into being a revolutionary speaker, you know, his relationship with George Jackson as well as others, man. Um, he became a radical. You know what I'm saying? Which is kind of understanding. When you hit the system at a young age, it's like going to college, you know. You come in, you maybe not have, you don't have your own I I ideals of thinking. You know what I mean? You start to form your own ideology of belief system that you have. And therefore, at the end of his career, you know, even in face, he was still, how you say, a, represent a representative of what he represented. He was a Mexican mafia member. He was an enemy. He was a canal. You know what I'm saying? But he wanted to see different change for his people. That's the same super gain that they tried to create in L.A. when they formed the M.A. He, he, he's seen a whole bigger picture that maybe we could run this whole damn state if we weren't at war or conflict with each other. Yeah, I think that's the picture that everybody's kind of seeing now. It's like, man, even if you don't work necessarily hand in hand on everything, there's enough for everybody to eat, man. And all that other stuff does is take away from the, the end game, which is the bag. You know, the bag's the end game for, for everybody in that life. You know what I mean? When you got all these other little skirmishes and, and other kind of dumb ass obstacles in your way, then you got to go around these other obstacles and taking away focus from the bag. You know, and it seems right now they got their focus in the correct place as far as a criminal organization goes. But hey, guess what? <laughs> there, there's a lot more indictments nowadays than there was when it started, too. Yeah, a absolute power corrupts, man. You you know, you got some other people that are feuding. They're even having their own issues. They're, they're feuding between the state and feds, but that's a whole other topic for a whole other video maybe in the future, man. But let's stick to Cheyenne, man. Um, you know, um. You know, his death, man, like we've heard, heard different stories from his death, man, too. You know, you got to remember he had bodyguards. His bodyguards got booked, too. One other individual got thrown off the tier as well. So there was those that actually tried to back him up. There was a few that ran that were considered cowards. Um, you know, some say that he pleaded for his life and then he, then he stood his ground. I don't know. We weren't there. You know what I'm saying? So there's going to be a lot of different historical points of what really occurred. I'll, I'm interested to hear from those that were there. You know what I mean? I think Mad Dog Padilla was there as well. Manzanas, Crackers, Joker, and Tiny. You know, and, and I said in our history, I think there may be one one of the person there at that time. I I want to say Wolf Wolfie, but I could be wrong. Um, no, Woodsy Woodsy was there as well. I think um, from Bakersfield, um, which is kind of ironic, is is he ended up getting killed several years later by Mundo. You know, me him and his brother. Hey, I can't imagine. I can't imagine Cheyenne coming out of the cell and begging, man. If 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 he was in the frame of mind to beg, he just wouldn't have came out of the cell. I don't think he begged either. I think he came out and knew what was going to happen. Yeah, he came out. I think he. I think he came out like a man, bro. You know that would be. I mean, just with the circumstances, like he could have just stayed in the room and just been like, if he was worried, he went out like a G, one, bro. From one person I know that talks to them, right? That talks to one of the dudes that was involved. I mean, a few of those dudes are still alive, right? They said they said that the, it was strategically planned, and that they hit his bodyguards first. You know what I'm saying so they they came with enough manpower. You know what I mean like five people. I think there I think there was maybe a total of three or four people. Um, one person actually stayed and fought with them. I think the other two ran. You know what I'm saying, and that gave them access to do what they what they did. They say 50 times. I thought it was they stabbed them 72 times. Maybe it's 50 times and then 22 times once he hit the ground. That's a lot. Um, yeah. But I, I know when he hit the ground, it, it was the reason why they continued to stab him after he was thrown off the tier when he landed was to make a statement. You know what I mean? That, you know, all, all these deaths aren't going to go in vain and that the, the NF's here to stay. That statement is behind the philosophy of superior killing power. 
Thanks to old Tibbs, superior killing power. That shit got drilled in my head every day. But that that's that's the kind of philosophy that goes into doing things like that. You know what I mean? Overkill, example. Well, it's, it's the whole purpose of doing the deed. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if you're going to make that move, the whole purpose is, is, is for that kill. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's why they, they started, that's why years later they started the SKP squads. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that was that was the beginning steps into becoming an NF member was to do was to be part of these SKP squads. Mm -hmm. So when you see hear about these deaths that are occurring now in prison, you know, um, a lot of them are, are, are north north on north related. Most you of them. Uh, well, most of them are high desert, Solano. Um, and you may wonder, okay, these dudes have 10 years. You know what I mean? Why are they killing someone in front of God, the guards, and everyone? It's because this is one step closer for them to make that that commitment that they're trying to seek to become an NF member. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you got you got you got aspirations like that, man. You gotta you gotta do weird stuff, I guess, man. Just don't go to jail, don't go to prison, don't try to join a gang. You won't have to kill nobody with a couple years left in the house. <laughs> hey, real man, talk. Some, man, some of these dudes, man, they're they're like four years to the house and they're getting killed in the cell, bro. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean, it just makes it just makes me wonder what's going on. Like I was listening to that video. Uh, that boxer did did with baby joker and he said it man he goes since when have, when are we killing our own people when are we killing north daniels the whole purpose sometimes with, with north daniels was is just to remove them off the yard we just didn't want them on our yard it wasn't necessary to take them take them take their life i mean you you would have to be a primary target to send an skp squad to take someone's life yeah. you know what i'm saying so it's just like on the six yard when someone got booked what happened usually it was with a tomahawk real quick bam you know what I mean? Or a real quick piece hit. You know what I mean? When you hit someone with a piece, the whole purpose is to take out, take them out. So before, I mean, you know, when I heard Baby Joker say that, I thought about it and I'm like, man, you know, that's true. If we're going to remove our own people, a lot of times, man, we just want them off the yard. They can't be with our functions. You know what I'm saying? Unless they did something like maybe they told or they disrespected a C or something like that. Then maybe, or they were a high power dropout that tried to hit the yard then maybe there'd be grounds to try to take their life, man. But th these kids are only like four years, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? What do they do? They owe 500 bucks. Okay, let's kill them. He lost a cell phone. Let's whack his ass. Hey, you know check I mean? this out, Flox. Hey, I, I was talking to uh, talking to somebody yesterday, bro. He's, he's a bro. I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, he told me they killed somebody one time because they, they, they didn't take a shower, bro. A regular northerner. Recently? A few years, some years back. But yeah, he, he missed the shower thing. They sent a youngster in there that was just in there for grand theft, 16 months, grand theft auto, killed him. It's like, you get what I'm, come you on, what man. Hey, if the dude don't want to shower, he's a J-cat. Slap the shit out of him, get him out get of him there. Off, get him off the yard. Maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. hit him with a tomahawk real quick or something like yeah, that. Yeah, killed him. Since, since the youngster was 16 months to the house, killed that dude, all behind the shower. You know, but that's a true statement. If you really think about that, Rojo, like, when have we sent manpower or tried to risk people catching a life sentence just over a dude that we just get deemed no good? You know what I mean? They, they weren't up to par with the functions. Monthly, bro. Monthly. You know? Whether it be in the county jail somewhere, in the state somewhere, it, it happens too frequently. The SKP is for a reason. It's not just for practice. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Straight up. And you know, and that's how you get caught up going there and miss the shower one day. Hey, these are lessons, man. I say these things for lessons. That's how easy you can get killed sometimes by your own people behind missing a shower. It happens. That's a cold one. That's cold. No doubt. Yeah, man. All right, man. I guess that wraps it up, no? That, that wraps it up, brother. It's supposed to be by Sham, but as always, we start to expand into other things, man. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, I, I enjoyed that video, though, man. I hope you guys did, too. YouTube, man, it's your boy Rojo, boy Flacco, and uh, we'll probably be at you live uh, tonight with a special guest, man. You never know. Hope you had a good Monday.